And what we're going to do at first is we're going to we're going to talk a little bit. And um, did some of you get handouts? Yes. Okay. Um, there's now, handouts on the chairs here. Okay. All right. Now, some of the handouts have a few errata in them. Um, and I want to apologize for that. And um, uh, what happened is uh, one or two of them were not the final drafts. And somehow or other, I got that to Jenny. But it, they're, they're small things and I'll point them out. Uh, but what yeah. we're going to be doing is we're going to be reading a handout. And uh, but then uh, most of it's just for you to take home and for yourself. OK, and some of it follows um, the uh, uh, PowerPoint presentations we're going to be looking at. Why, um, Ernie? Yeah. Did you want to share now what you have? Yeah, that'd be fine. Um, yes, he has some announcements to make. A, a quick announcement, really. Um, after the last couple of uh, lessons, my wife and I went back to a video series that we've been um, watching on occasion that National Geographic uh, put out about a year ago, the history and archaeology of the Bible. And uh, the two programs, one on the time of Joseph and the time of the other one on the time of Moses and the Exodus, both provided, struck us as having a lot of helpful background information about what's going on in Egypt at the time, about transportation routes across the Sinai and various things like that. So um, next Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, um, I will be showing those two segments via Zoom. Jenny will be sending out links uh, probably Tuesday or Wednesday. And I'd invite anyone who's interested in learning a little more about sort of the history and political context of these Bible stories uh, to log on. So that'll be next Sunday, the 20th at two o'clock. So watch for the Zoom link from Jenny sometime this week. Okay, well, thank you so much. That's great that you're doing that. Um, I would like everyone to take your first hand out, but we're going to pray together. Um, Ernie, could you lead us in prayer, please? Sure. Thank you. Gracious God, we thank you that on this snowy day we can be together to learn about your work with your people many decades and years, millennia ago. Um, open our hearts to learn from these ancient stories. Be with Sue as she leads us in our discussion, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask this. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, then people can be joining us as, as you know, as, as, we, as we continue. Uh, hi, Julie. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, got it. Hi, great, Sue. great, great. We're great. unmuted for this part. I'd like you, everyone, to take the little handout that you have here called The Relationship Between Law and Narrative in the Book of Exodus. And um, it's by a scholar. The, the thoughts are just a summary of, of some points that a scholar named Terence Bretheim made. Do you have that handout with you? No. You don't? No. Okay, well, let me let me discuss it with you then. Maybe maybe the people. Let, let me just go ahead and, and share with you what he had to say. Um, Fredheim, Fredheim was a scholar. He wrote a, a commentary in uh, 1988, and then it's been updated, and there's a newer edition now. And he stresses that one of the most distinctive characteristics of Old Testament law is that it is enclosed by narrative. Now, what he means by that, and we've already covered it a bit, remember we were, and I'm just uh, touching base with you, you remember that we were reading about the narrative of uh, the Israelites in the wilderness, and that was in Exodus 15, 22 to Exodus 15 through 18. 
And so that section of Exodus talks about a wilderness narrative. Now there, there's going to be more about the wilderness, but that was just like the initial part of it before they come to Mount Sinai. So then he talks about the structure of Exodus 19, 1 to 40, 33. Now I'm just going to read this to you. You won't remember all the scripture references, but I want you to give, give you the general idea about his observation. In 19, 1 to 25, he, we have what he calls story, but by that he means the narrative, the description of the action. And then in 20, Exodus 20, 1 to 17, that's the Decalogue, that's the Ten Commandments. Then in 20, 18 to 21, the balance of chapter 20, he's got, um, he's got more, he, he described, he says there's more narrative. Then in 22 to 23, 20, 22 to 23, 33, in other words, chapters 20 through 23, they have a spe special section of law called the covenant code. See, so it goes narrative, law, narrative, law, it's arranged that way. Then in 24, 1 to 18, he calls that narrative, but what it, it, it is, but it's describing a covenant ceremony. Now in 25.1 to 31.18, that's about, talks about the priesthood, talks about the tabernacle, and again, it's, um, it's kind of priestly material. Then in 32.1 to 34.35, he has more narrative, and that narrative is about the idolatry in the wilderness where they lapsed into idolatry. We're going to be looking at that next week. And then we'll come back to, we're going to look at that next week, and then we'll come back to more of this um, narrative. And then in 35, 1 to 40, 38, there's all this about the tabernacle. So you can see it's arranged that way, where the narrative's interspersed with this giving of uh, the law. So Fred Heim emphasizes the significance of the interrelationship between the law and the narrative. So he asked this rhetorical question, what is the significance of the literary placement of both the law and the narrative? Why does, he's saying what's significant about it theologically? He, he observes the structure and he says, what's significant about it? And he makes 10 points and I'm gonna read this to you. And then what we will do, we will send it out to you to be sure everyone gets it. Uh, number one, God is the subject in both the law and the narrative pretty straightforward. And Fredheim remarks that the narrative enables a fuller picture of the God who stands behind the law, while the law enhances the image of God available in the narrative. So there's an interrelationship there. And then number two, law is more clearly seen as he calls it a gift of God's graciousness. Now, um, he what what he what he actually says on page 21 is from the story it is clear that the law is grounded in a personal and gracious divine will and so we saw how god was providing them food and providing them water and watching over them while they're in the wilderness now it doesn't mean like in numbers we're gonna there's some places where there's some real judgment <clears throat> But what's happening here is God is graciously providing for them, testing them to bring out their character and to lead them to trust in God. <clears throat> then um, it, going to point three, he said that narrative keeps the personal character of this law front and center. Experience has shown how easy it is for the law to become um, an impersonal matter. And what happened in the development of all this, and I'm just going to give like a, a maybe a simplified overview, is the law was considered everything that Pastor Don just preached about. That was the view of the law. And what happened over time, I mean, I really thank the Lord for that sermon. I said, you know, I, I, as a teacher, I try to, especially journey class, I like to be an open for everybody to, you know, say what they think. But, but my real passion is for you to get exactly what Pastor Todd already said. It's just amazing. So I just went there. He surely is a God named Jesus. <laughs> but um it became, it became impersonal in that under the pharisaic influence, there was 
accretions and accretions and accretions and accretions. There was a law and then there were additional laws. And so, and they had a lot of additions as particularly to the ceremonial law. And so uh, we're going to talk more as the class goes on about this issue about law and what it is. But what happened, uh, like in the book of Galatians, um, the Apostle Paul says, what's the matter with you since you have already received this graciousness? He's talking to Jews and Gentiles. He says, if you already experienced this graciousness of knowing Jesus Christ, why do you want to be under the law again? Well, what had happened was in that circumstance is this, some people called Judaizers that came from uh, Jerusalem, some the scholars debate some they may have come from Jerusalem and they may have also be right there in the congregation but what they were doing where they were telling the general Gentile Christians you must have circumcision in addition to all this in order to be saved and Paul was opposed to that in the book of Acts you might want to go to Acts 15 there was a Jerusalem council and they were also trying to iron out this issue but what has happened over time is people came to have this common assumption that the Old Testament's all law, it's all legalism. The only thing that's really important right now is the New Testament, and it got a little bit skewed. So then his, um, his fourth point is this integration keeps the divine action and the human response closely related to each other. So there's, we're going to be talking about divine initiative, human response. And then he said that this integration of the law and the narratives he's talking about illustrates that creation theology is a prevailing theme of the book of Exodus. Now, um, he makes some important observations in this respect. He said the Egyptians, I'm quoting on page 204, the Egyptians have been an example par excellence of how the justice of God's world order has been subverted, creating injustice, oppression, and social chaos. The law is given to the people of God as a vehicle through which Egypt will not be repeated among them. And we already covered that they're moving away from slavery to the Pharaoh to another kind of sense of slavery in quotation marks, whereby they're fully submitted to God. So the motivation given for the obedience um, uh, to law is contained in the narrative. And what he said there is he said uh, the motivation given to them was since they were slaves in Egypt, they need to pay attention to being compassionate and just with those who, is dis who are disadvantaged. See how all this interrelates? So then his other points, and I'm just going to share briefly, is for the law to be a part of the story it means that it's not, and, and, and Pastor Don said this in his sermon, for law to be a part of a story, of story means, or it could be a part of the narrative, means that it's not abstracted or isolated from life. Law is integrated with life in two ways. And he said law emerges from the matrix of observations about life itself. And the law is woven back into the very fabric of life. And so his point too, and, and other scholars make this point, is he had already redeemed them. And now God is giving them this gracious law. So his ninth point is that the integration of law and narrative becomes another form of witness to God and what God has done. Now, later, we're going to be looking at the law in more detail. So we're going to be talking about how God is in the details. But Today, I'm at the end of everything. If I have, get to the end here, I'm going to talk about just a brief reflection about that, but we'll look at that more further in, in ensuing weeks. But there's some questions you might have about individual laws, and there might be some definite questions still about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament in terms of law. But the point that Fredheim is making is the way that the narrative set up in Exodus is this, there's this overwhelming initiative on God's part, but he's also calling for their response. 
and then there's this law. So it's interrelated. And the tradition, has, he also says that the tradition has given the word Torah to both law and narrative genres. And the force of this is that the Pentateuch is instruction in both its laws and its stories. And, you know, Pastor Don brought that out. And he said, yet life is not to be shaped in terms of, he, he said the life of faith itself is narrative, it is story. And so what he's trying to say, I think, in brief, is this sense of the gracious instruction is not isolated from their life and not a isolated from this relationship that they're developing with God. So that's kind of like my little preaching that Pastor Don already preached. <laughs> Thank you for that little intro. I'm, I'm going to share my screen with you right now. And we're going to look at some detail. This is a brief PowerPoint, and it's called Sustaining a People, that God sustained them through this period. And what we're going to talk about today, one we've already covered, the interrelationship between law and narrative was an introduction. And then in this PowerPoint, that God sustains a people, it's only 16 slides. There's another handout, but the handout has a lot of material the same, on the, the same as the slide. And if you have the handout, it'll complement it, but you can just track the slide presentation. And then I have a brief handout on the concept of covenant. Then if we have time, we'll be examining the 10 commandments. And I have a PowerPoint called Up Close and Personal about that. And then a brief reflection that God is in the details. So, um, Exodus 19, uh, 3 to 6 reads, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say, we're, and we're going to be in Exodus 19 to about 24. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly king, a kingdom and a holy nation. Now, I've underlined these, these phrases. I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And I touched, we touched upon that at the end of the last segment. And then these phrases, treasure possession, a priestly kingdom, a holy nation. And so the explanation here is that this 19, 3 to 6, it's what we kind of call a hinged text between the narrative of Exodus redemption and the experience in the wilderness, and the forging of the covenant on Mount Sinai. And verses 4 to 6, the text looks back to what Yahweh had did. I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And it looks, looks forward to what Yahweh is declaring and what Yahweh will do. So this is a passage in Deuteronomy, which is uh, similar. It says... Um, he sustained him in a desert land, in a howling wilderness. He shielded him, him being referring to Israel Jacob. He sustained him in a desert land, in a howling wilderness waste. He shielded him and carried him, guarded him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, as it spread out its wings, takes them up and bears them on his pinion, on his pinions. The Lord alone guided him and no foreign God was with him. And so it's this image 
It's in 19, 1 to 6, and here also in Deuteronomy 32, 10 to 33, of the Lord being like an eagle, kind of a maternal image of God carrying them through this time. Now, I have going to be showing a um, video by a, a artist named uh, Josh Groban, and his song is based on Simon, Psalm 97, 1 to 6, and that also has this image about carrying on eagle's wings. Now, I want to say to you that in my, on my with my computer, technology, technology, my computer does not project noise at, sound outward. That's why I'm wearing um, these uh, earphones because I, I can hear you when you're speaking because it projects it toward me. Um, I don't know if the, if the uh, Westminster system will show, uh, have the words to this video, but you should be able to see the pictures and the words. You might be able to hear the singing. So let's see here. Not quiet out to us. So you need to go back to where you, before you share your screen, there is a switch that has to be turned on for the sound of a video to be shown. Or okay. To be okay. Let me stop share. Okay. Wait a minute. Okay. Where, Ernie? Uh, well, Hit, um, let me try and think. Hit screen share, just the button to get you to the what's on your screen. Advanced, basic. Uh, and over, I think in the bottom left, you'll si see a little button that says- Share sound. Share sound. Okay, now I'll hit share screen too, right? Right, after that. And, and go back to where I am, okay. Drag that bar back over to the beginning. Got it. Uh, there you go. Can you hear it now? Wait a minute. Yeah. Great. Who knew? Thank you, Marie. Welcome.
So what we see here is a, in Psalm 97, what it was, was it was like, and in some other Psalms, were sort of like a priestly benediction, like when worshipers would leave the sanctuary, oh, may you be blessed and may this happen and may you be protected on your journey back. And so I don't think Psalm 97 actually says that famine will do you no harm. That was an added phrase in the song. But basically what it was saying was it was wishing them well, but also extending God's blessing on them for say traveling mercies. So the point here is though, that I think Josh Groban captures his music, that God wants to hold the people of God in the palm of God's hand, a very beautiful, image. I want to go on the next slide here now. Now, we're going to be talking about the phrase special treasure that's in this Exodus 19, 1 to 6 that we just read. And the Hebrew word for special treasure is segula. Say that with me. Segula. I want to hear it. Segula. 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 Yeah. You got it. Yes. And that little raised E is what they call a schwa sound. So it's not like an, it's not like segula, but segula. Segula. You did really well with that. Now, I want to tell you a personal story. Um, I was teaching in Korea and I was trying to say to myself, how can I convey to them the concept of a special treasure? So I wanted to them to think about something. It, that they yeah. possessed that was very special to them. And uh, what I did is I said to them that um, I had my grandmother's watch and I, it was in a nice case. And it's really not that expensive, but it was a treasure to me because it had been handed down. So it has a little bit of value, but it had been passed on. But you know what? I had no, I couldn't really see a response. They weren't really getting it. I was trying to ask them to share what was their special treasure. Now they're a little bit more reluctant to talk at first than, than you know, Americans are, but they will talk. So they, then um, I finally, you know, got them to mention some things that are of value to them. And so another year I tried this. I tried saying, I felt a little corny, but I explained that my the relationship that Bill and I have is a special treasure to me. I've tried to take it away from like a physical treasure, but so I really couldn't think of it. So what happened was um, I took, drew, I drew their attention to first Chronicles 29.3, which I have the new uh, revised standard version here. And in the context of that, King David is speaking. And King David says, more often, in, moreover, in addition to all I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure, and the Hebrew word is the same, segula, of, my, of, of gold and silver, and because of my devotion to the holy house of God, I give it to the house of God. So he, he had given silver and gold and all sorts of precious metals and what have you for the house of God that they were building. Um, the temple, but what happened is that he also added his own special treasure, and that helped them to really get the concept. Now, do, this is also in uh, Deuteronomy, um, and it says that, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and it continues, the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the earth to be his treasure possession, and the Hebrew is segula. If, do you have your hand out for that? Yes. For special treasure? Okay. Yes. Well, you can see right off that right by the title, there's a mistake with the two E's. It's a typing mistake. Just cross it out for yourself. This is for you. And the material on here is the same, pretty much as the slide presentation. But then I have some extra material on the slides. But down here at the bottom of page one, where I'm discussing Zagula, I have some scripture references, Deuteronomy 7, 6, see? And the next one is Deuteronomy 40, 14, 2. And that reads, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. It is you the Lord has chosen out of all the peoples of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. And there's that Hebrew Zagula again. And then I'd like a classroom uh, participant to read the passage on the next page. 
Oh, wait a minute. What did not this week? If does somebody have a Bible where you can read Deuteronomy 26, 18 to 19? Anybody with a Bible? I do. Can you read it for us? <clears throat> Second, I gotta find Deuteronomy again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Deuteronomy 26, 18 to 19. 6, 18 to 19. Today, the Lord has ordained your agreement to be his treasured people as he promised you and to keep his commandments for him to set you high above all the nations that he has made in praise and in frame and in honor and for you to be a people holy to the Lord your God as he promised. Yeah. So basically, they were calling them to be sort of a people set apart, but a people who would also sort of be like a witness to the other, they say nations, but the idea is other people groups. And so uh, in Deuteronomy, what's happening is that it's a reformulation of the law in Exodus for another um for a whole nother group of people for the, uh, you know, for, for another generation that's also in the wilderness. And so this is carried on from, uh, they understand it from generation to generation. And then in the New Testament we have, but you are, a, now this is, a, this is the new American standard version. And it reads, for you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Now, once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so this whole concept of being a special uh, people, treasure to God, uh, was carried over into uh, the New Testament and speaking about the Christian community. The concept of fashioning a people, here we have it in Psalm 135, 4, for the Lord God has chosen Jacob himself and Israel for his particular treasure. So this concept continued. And then uh, Deuteronomy 7, 6 uh, that we already read says, for you are a holy people unto Yahweh your God. Yahweh your God has chosen you to be his own. And I like the image because it looks like something that might be in a real treasure. <laughs> now, we're going to be keep exploring this with the concept of the kingdom of priests. And Christopher Wright emphasizes what priests did. They brought the teaching of the law to the people. And the priests brought the people's sacrifices for, before God. And in this sense, they represented the people in God's presence. And the priests had the responsibility to bless the people in the name of Yahweh. So the Israelites, uh, right suggests that the Israelites were to convey God to the rest of humankind. And they were to be ministers of God by submitting to God and blessing the nations. And that's from two different sources. Continuing with this thought, and here Wright is citing another scholar named Durham, um, and I looked at, I checked with Durham's original source, and I'm so I'm basically citing Durham here on page 263. Uh, Nick, could you read this for me, where it says Israel is a holy people? Yes. Is oh, the only problem is the pictures cut the end off on my screen. Okay, well, if I move the picture, could we be able to see it again? Yeah, if you can you mean, move of, the picture, of the people. If you could move the, let me see if I can minimize the picture. There, does that help? I got rid of it. Yeah, I got rid of it. Okay, Israel, good. Israel is a holy people, then represents a third dimension of what it means to be committed in faith to Yahweh. For example, in addition to being a treasured possession and a kingdom of priests, there are to be a people set apart different from all other people by what they are and are becoming, a display, display people, a showcase to the world of how being in covenant with Yahweh changes its people. Thank you for reading. You're welcome. 
Okay, uh, let's have someone else read the next paragraph. Gabrielle, do you mind reading? Can you see it? Yep. There's okay. a strong ethical demand in the Old Testament for the people of God to live holy lives. The people are not to follow the way of the idols in the other cultures around them. They are not to practice immorality or impurity of any kind. This holiness can impact every do domain of your life, including your family life, your personal choices, your social life, your economies, and how you treat people who are foreigners or aliens among you. So what, right, what Durham is doing here is um, it's talking, they're, they're moving from kingdom priest to kind of talking about what it might mean to be a holy people. So then we have this again in 1 Peter 2, 9 to 12, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not re received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So we're going to, what, I'm, what I did is I looked at Jonathan Sachs' thought about a royal priesthood, and it's, it's going to be really interesting because, because I kind of compare Sachs and Wright and what they were saying. Sachs asserts that a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, he writes, a mere four words in the original Hebrew, was to become the shortest, simplest, most challenging mission statement of the Jewish people. Now, see, he applies it to the Jewish people. He said, and um, he remarks that Exodus 19, 1 to 6 is like an invitation to the covenant. Well, I, I brought you on eagle's wing and as I drew you to myself and I'm, I'm calling you here to be a special treasure and a, a royal priesthood and a holy nation. It's almost like a prologue to the covenant, which will be spelled out on Mount Sinai. And right now, the people are at the base of the mountain. And he specifies the Jews, but he specifies the Jews were never a kingdom of priests. He said priesthood fell to Aaron and his sons. Even Moses was not a priest. So he makes some introductory comments. He adds, what is more, priesthood as such is not seen by the Torah as a distinctly, distinctively Jewish or Israelite phenomena. Melchizedek, Abraham's contemporary, is described as a priest of the Most High God. And he quotes Genesis 14:18. Sack cites other examples. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, was a Midianite priest. And Sachs observes that all ancient religions had priests. See, there's an image. So why, he asks, this is his rhetorical question, Sachs's, why is it so distinctive for God to call the Hebrew people a kingdom of priests? And Sachs refers to an interpretation put forward by this scholar named Sforno, and who lived from 1470 to 1550, a philosopher of the Renaissance. Sforno's interpretation, though, is similar to Christopher Wright. Sforno says Israelites stand in relation to the rest of humanity as Aaron stood vis-a-vis -vis the Israelites, and they are, as it were, the world's priests whose task it is to teach the entire human race that all shall call upon the name of God and serve God with one accord, as indeed will be the role of Israel in the future. Sachs elaborates on this interpretation of kingdom of priests. Sachs points out that priests were called to minister to God in the holy place, but they had other functions. He points out that in the ancient world, people could read and write because they had, you know, the Hebrew alphabet, and they conveyed religion to the people. However, he points out that the law God was about to reveal to, at Mount Sinai would become the possession of every member of the nation. For Sachs, this access to the covenant marked a certain dignity and equality, which he attributes to their access to the Hebrew alphabet. But be it as it may, Sachs continues, the Jewish people was summoned 
to become, as it were, a nation of constitutional lawyers. Now, I, you know, I, I don't know about his parallel here about the constitution and, and the law, but, I, but, I, but the idea was like, it, it's incumbent upon a people in, I, I would think about contemporary society, it's incumbent upon us to understand our constitution, to know what our constitution says. So you might hear different people appealing to the constitution to make their point, but as a citizen, you need to know the constitution to be able to kind of adjudicate what's being said. But the Jewish people was summoned to be as it were a nation of constitutional lawyers. That to a remarkable sense is what they became, he, he asserts at least in the rabbinic period. But the idea is that the people are supposed to know this, not just the specialists. And for Sachs, God was the instructor and Israel the pupils. And in Psalm 147, 19 to 20, reads, he, referring to God, has revealed his word to Jacob, his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know his laws. Hallelujah. <laughs> and they did become, there did become eventually a distinction um, as, Ju as Judaism progressed, that sort of an us and them. There's us who have the law and those who don't. But the thought of Saxon Wright in conversation is that this idea of the people being a kingdom of priests is unprecedented. As Sachs remarks, there is nothing quite like this in the annals of the religious experience of humankind. And his opinion, an opinion here that I advance is that the views of Christopher Wright and Jonathan Sachs seem complementary. Uh, Sachs, I'm going to be on uh, the next slide, uh, and it was a slide coming up. Uh, Sachs wants to uh, translate this one word, goy, as nation. And I think that right would uh, translate it more like people group, but we'll get to that. But pretty much they seem in agreement. And right emphasizes what the priests do. And I'll repeat, they brought the teaching of the law to the people, and the priests brought the people's sacrifices before God. And they represented uh, the people in God's presence. So the priest had the responsibility also to bless the people in the name of Yahweh. And the Israelites thus were to convey God to the rest of humankind. And they were to be ministers of God by submitting to God and blessing the nations. And Sachs emphasizes that not just one man, a priest, or a priestly class group, represents Yahweh, but the people have this function. Holy nation. The Hebrew for holy nation is Goy Kadosh. Say with me, Goy Kadosh. Goy Kadosh. Again, Goy Kadosh. You got it, great. So holy nation. Goy can mean people or nation. So I looked up a lot of things, and I'm going to just give a general gist. In Genesis, um, Goy can refer to the descendants of Abraham, to the descendants of Sarah, to the descendants of Jacob. Jacob and Esau were two Goy. You can translate a nation, but you can also translate people groups that were struggling. Um, then you have uh, in Exodus, uh, Goy referring uh, to the people here where we are in uh, Exodus 19. And then uh, elsewhere, you're going to have uh, late Israel Jacob referred to as the, the nation that God's choosing. But then on the other hand, in many other places in the Old Testament, Goy is kind of used like those people. Those who are not us, the, the non-Israelites were also called Goy. So it was used various ways. So this word can be translated both ways. Why am I going into all this detail? Well, there's a big debate and it has to do with the chosenness of Israel. And what does that mean? And so are they so special? Are they so different from all the other people groups that live in the world? We'll, we'll get to that, but in, and I'm gonna be coming to that, but 
Exodus 19, 1 to 6 calls them a special people, but in that same text, it says the whole earth is mine. So God's saying they're spe special, but God's also saying that God has regard for the whole earth. But on the other hand, and this is just my opinion, I think that there's something special going on with the people descended from this powerful ancient times. And so um, I, I don't put a political spin on it and attribute it to you know, Israel as a nation per se, but other people will. And all I can tell you right now is uh, linguistically, the debate issue hinges on this word goy. And so Sax is going to translate goy as nation. Sachs discusses common associations with the word holy, such as honoring the Sabbath day set aside and thus holy, and also the tabernacle had sections called the holy place and the most holy place. And Sachs emphasizes that those who are in the wilderness at the base of Sinai are called a nation before they come to the land. And usually a people becomes a nation, he explains, after securing land and de developing a set of laws or a constitution. But Sachs argues that these people in the wilderness are a nation under God. God is their sovereign, and he asserts that nothing like this had happened before. So there's a concept here of covenant. Again, Exodus 19, 3 to 6. Nancy, do you mind reading Exodus 19, 3 to 6 here? Sure. Thank then you. Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words you shall speak to the Israelites. I'm gonna, thank you. I'm gonna share with you some selected observations. And these are my own. There's a condition here. See that phrase in red, if you obey my voice and heed my covenant? The condition, though, is embedded in a description of God's overwhelming initiative in drawing the people to God's self. They are a special treasure that belongs to God, and yet Yahweh declares in the same sentence that the whole earth is mine. So God's not neglecting the rest of the earth or the rest of the people groups in this calling of, uh, calling of the descendants. They are called to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And Exodus 19, 16 following describes how the people were consecrated in order to encounter God at the base of the mountain. And the Sinai covenant opens in chapter 20 with the 10 commandments. They had this sense that they were approaching the holy. So in how, this, how, it, how it flows, in Exodus 19, God encounters the people. He declares them to be a special treasure a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and has them come to the base of Sinai. And then in Exodus 20, 1 to 17, there are the Ten Commandments. And then after that, 21 to 23, technically, that section is called the Covenant Code. And it has some laws, especially in chapters 21 and 22, that are, have an if-then clause. If this, therefore this. If this happens, then such and such is the case. We'll be looking at those later. But Exodus 24 has a covenant ceremony. Now, your handout might say covenant renewal ceremony, but it's a covenant ceremony. And um, I'd like you to turn to your uh, handout called the concept of covenant. Do you have it? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So I have, there's a basic definition that we can work with. And a, that's this, that a covenant is a binding relationship. And usually, like if I'm teaching in the classroom, I write it on the whiteboard. And if I write something on the whiteboard, that means you're going to see it on a test. <laughs> but there's this long um, 
uh, definition by Bernard Anderson is a little fuller. They didn't have to know that in the test, but, um, but I wanted them to understand the concept. Um, Bernard Anderson explains that a covenant is, quote, a binding relationship that is based on commitment that carries with it, pro carries with it promises and obligations and has the quality of constancy and durability. And so Hamilton brings out uh, that this is this wording in Exodus 19 and again in 20. It's not making them God's people because he got it in the narrative. God had already called them my people. And I've listed for you the places where this is 3 7, 3 10, 422, my firstborn son, and uh, 5 33, Moses says to God, Your people. So often a covenant elevates to a more intimate level an already existing dynamic relationship between two parties. And there's all kinds of covenants in the Old Testament. So there can be a covenant, a binding agreement between two people. It might be about the well or sharing land or something like this. But there's also covenants that God initiates with the people of God. And in this, God is entering into what? An already existing relationship that God has with the people, but it's a binding relationship. So um, in marriage, the couple probably already knows each other. They probably have a relationship. They might have a good relationship. Nowadays, people go, we have a good relationship. Let's have a baby. Let's say we have a good relationship. Let's get a house. Maybe they get married. Maybe they don't. But the idea here with marriage is that you're taking this relationship and you're, it's coming into a deeper level of commitment and relationship based on the relationship with God. But here we're just talking about covenant in general. Now, I'm going to just mention something briefly because I, I could do a whole separate there, section there, just about. There, yes, there, yes. There's, there's a lot of places there where I think some of us would like to make some comments or discuss some points. So yeah, yeah, please. Do, do you want us to wait to the end or do you want to? I just want to make one more comment. Okay. And right. then, I, then, I, then what I was going to do is ask you to comment. Okay. okay? Great. Do you, do you think that your comments should come first? That'd be fine with no, me. No, no. Okay. No, no. Well, well, I was just going to share with you. That they mention they mention Abrahamic covenant, uh, you know the covenant was made with Abraham. And, well, there's covenant made with Noah, covenant made with Abraham. There's the Sinai covenant, and there was a covenant with uh, the line of David. So, what this is is they believe, especially the Sinai covenant, is directly connected with the covenant with Abraham. So it's it's kind of an all encompassing concept here of covenant whereby god is committing god's self to this relationship so jump in people with your comments please okay the, the, the comment that's burning in my throat here is one of the reasons it's, it's been you know, hypothesized that the jews were singled out was the fact that they had a tradition of believing that their god descended or was part of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph. And therefore it was a singular God. It wasn't a multi-God. And when you go to the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, they shall not have strange gods before me. He's basically taking on Egypt, Mesopotamia, all the ancient countries of the world that had many gods. And basically the Jews were the only ones who had this idea of a singular, all dominating God, that it was a descendant of their people. And, you know, I think that's a very important point to take into consideration of why it seems God singled them out. It was that they had this tradition of believing in one God as opposed to multiple gods. Interesting. And thank you so much to bring that out because that's really important. And also um, the emphasis too. The God is, I've been saying God is the initiator, but you're suggesting 
why you think that is so. And I, it is true. The commandments say not to have any other gods. And we're going to get into that when we have the PowerPoint on the Ten Commandments. Anybody, any other comments, please? Hi, Anyone else? It's, yeah. It's, oh, we had a hand raised. Susan. Yeah, hi. Um, hi. <laughs> I really appreciate the um, uh, everything you've presented today. I, I related, though, to something um, within my lifetime that I experienced, and that was uh, to grow up um, in my middle years in an in almost entirely Jewish community. And oh, really? That's yes, fascinating. Yes. And the, the, uh, the, uh, my neighbors referred to those who were not Jewish as the goyim. Yeah. And my mm -hmm. heart is telling me that they were, ex well, they were extraordinarily accepting and gracious and uh, um, to our family. But uh, my heart's telling me that, the, you know, they are, they were very inclusive. And on um, the one hand, I, I heard, I've heard many people thinking that they are exclusive or think themselves as being, ex you know, um set aside as a people but yet they refer to my family and gentiles as the goyim the nation so i just thought i'd share that no thank you for sharing that and there let me, is let now me, let me jump on yes. susan's point yes. i also grew up in a 98 percent jewish neighborhood really that had yeah that had orthodox conservative and reformed jews had three temples within 10 blocks <laughs> I, I was asked to be the house boy. And what the house boy did was on Saturdays, when they, the conservative and Orthodox Jews could not answer their telephone or turn on their lights, they would have me come into their house and do those functions for them. So I was called the house boy. House boy. Oh boy. That's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> wow. So it, yeah. could be, it could be people or it can be a person. Yeah, I I can jump in here too. In one of my earlier uh, uh, careers of designing medical garments, I worked with a company in in um, Northeast Philadelphia, and um, there were it was run by two Jewish brothers, and I remember when I first started doing this. Uh, the one brother said to the other, why are you working with her? She's Goyim. Right. Oh. So it was, it was difficult for one to understand why the other was embracing the other. And, uh, and one of them totally embraced me and walked me through a process that I never would have been able to do without, without them. I, I think I want to add um, this that there's, there's kind of like, um, there's kind of like a, well, it was back in the 1990s when I was in seminary and, uh, and I was, I was selected to be, um, to go to a conference for the national conference between Christians and Jews. And I was, got to speak with some conservative and, uh, um, reformed, uh, rabbis, um, and uh, we were discussing the text of Isaiah, and I happened to have some, you know, information about Isaiah. So I, I was sharing, and we were talking about Isaiah 53 from a Christian and a Jewish perspective. And I found that through dialogue, we were developing mutual respect. Does that make sense? Yes. So, yeah. yeah. And I think that what some of the testimonies here are that it's not just that uh, I, I, I by no means want to say that the Jewish people as a whole, um, you know, are exclusivists in their thinking. Now, some individuals might be, but what's happening is I see a shift also in leadership and a lot of dialogue. And it really, uh, I think a lot of change that comes be, uh, with attitudes toward different groups is actually knowing people actually yeah. living with and having the relationships. And that's what I hear you, all of you saying. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's 1145. And so uh, I could go on and on. <laughs> so this is wonderful. Pick, yeah, well, we're going to thank you so much. We're going to pick up with the Ten Commandments. This, uh, the, I want to make a comment, and you'll see it on my Ten Commandments slide. This uh, presentation of the Ten Commandments that I'll be giving, I had uh, given it in Korea. And so I really had to think about how to get across the concept of the Ten just the Ten Commandments. We're not talking about the rest of the law. And um, I, 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 this PowerPoint, some of you I know have seen because uh, Presbyterian women had a, had a block on the Ten Commandments and there were men and women in the opening uh, presentation that I gave. And so some of you have seen this PowerPoint. However, I've uh, edited it and enhanced the graphics some. But in the very first commandment, God is saying, I am the Lord, your God, who took you out of Egypt. It's very up close and personal. And he's saying, I'm the God that delivered you from this culture. You This, this ties into what Nick was saying. I'm the God that delivered you out of this culture that had the multiple deities, idols, if you will. And he's saying, you shall have, oh, and, and there were idol influences from Samaria and all kinds of other cultures. But the point is, and Israel had some of its own idols, but the point is, is you shall have no other gods before me. There's a bit of a singularity here too. There's an exclusiveness, but also a particularity, and we're going to get into that. So I thank I everyone so much. Yes. I was just going to say that the word covenant is very special. It, it's really more than an agreement. It's like a divine bond between the people and God. It, 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 yes. It, it's beyond the law. It's beyond everything. It is divine. And I think you have to keep that in mind that this covenant was a, a very special covenant. And it yeah. was something that was in the Israelites' DNA as well as God's. So the word covenant can't be glossed over. It is a very special meaning to it. Yeah, very special meaning. And that's why I'm elevating this concept of a relationship. The technical word is a binding relationship, but it's a relationship. And so there's a divine party and a human party involved. Yeah. Parties. Yeah, great. Well, again, I'm, I'm going to have to sign off because of our time, and I thank everyone. Thank, thank you. So much. Yeah, yeah. And we'll see you next week. And also, uh, next week at, what, Ernie, is at 2 o'clock? What are you giving? 2, two, two o'clock, yeah. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Ernie's going to be presenting some stuff. Thank is you. That, that's could next could week, you Ernie? go? Yeah, next week, the 20th. Okay. Could you go over that again? I came in a little bit late. Yeah. Okay, um, next on their uh, National Geographic did a new series about a year ago on the history and archaeology of the Bible. And the two programs, one on the time of Joseph and one on Moses and the Exodus, provide a lot of background to what we've been discussing around the biblical text. So um, I've worked everything works out, we should have a Zoom conversation next Sunday afternoon, and I'll show those, they're each 30 minute segments. And I think it uh, fills in some of the background and the context in which- Geography. The geography oh, and so on. Um, so next Sunday, the 20th at two o'clock, Jenny says she will send out a link during the week. Oh, wonderful, Watch. wonderful, okay. That's great. Thanks for going over it again. Thank you so much. I'm glad we went over it again. Yeah. And this is okay. Robbie Spillman. Um, Jenny's not back yet. So I think it may be helpful if you stop the recording and end the meeting. Otherwise, it'll just keep going. Yes, well, I'm, I see I've got my, I got out of share screen. I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to say exit. When I hit exit, everybody sort of leaves. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.